Hello and welcome to the 12th edition of our podcast series, Talking Data, which offers timely insights into macro data and its impact on the economy and markets. I'm Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading. I will be today's moderator. Our podcast features Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Today's topic is what stories really matter. Jim and Ben will specifically be discussing politics, COVID-19, and the economy. Jim, we're going to get started with you today. Why don't you kick us off with talking about politics and specifically the election and fiscal stimulus? Thanks, Kirsten. Yeah, um, I know everybody's focused on the election, and you should be. It's an important event. But then the question becomes, is it an important event for markets? And there's two ways I want to answer this. The first way I want to answer it is, if you look at the betting markets, it's putting at Trump at around 38 to 40% chance of winning. If you look at the poll analyzers like Nate Silver or The Economist Magazine, Nate Silver 538, it's giving him about a 10 to 12% chance of winning. The betting markets seem to align with investors' preferences, investor preferences. So there might be some more Biden wins to be priced in the market, but not much more. I think more to the point, when you look at the election, it's gonna be about, and this always happens every election, election night, you're gonna say, wow, no one expected fill in the blank. And whatever that thing is, we didn't expect, maybe it's Trump does worse than we expect, or Trump does better than we expect, or Biden does very well, but the Republicans do well in the Senate or vice versa, or something will happen that goes, wow, no one saw that coming. There's your event in the market, and that can't really be predicted. So I would be more thinking that there's a little bit of Biden left in this market to price in because investors may be holding out a little bit more higher probabilities than the polls. Um, or it's really about, I think that there's going to be a surprise on, well, unknowable on election night, and then the markets will have to zig or zag according to it. How about you, Ben? What's your thoughts on the election? Yeah, I mean, everybody's pretty much hedged. As we were just kind of talking about this morning, even the move index moving, you know, the one month options moving over to the election, you saw the pop in, in that volatility, implied volatility, you know, in the treasury market, they're kind of hedging more so for a rise in rates, you know, which is again, leading toward, leaning towards the Biden victory, um, not surprisingly. Um, you know, same thing if you look at the VIX and the term structure of, of those futures. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's, it's somewhat baked in the cake. We had this, this Biden victory and I agree that it had to be a big surprise to get things, things kind of rattled. Um, in the end, a lot of this is kind of uh, wrapped around the fiscal stimulus debate that's become so attached to the riskier ends of the market, like your high yield market or even uh, tips break evens. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I, I would agree we'd have to have a surprise. Um, now, some, there might be still some room for some of these Biden favored sectors and industries to run. We saw that this month, um, really since the end of September, things like green technology, as you got that big spread at 10% in, in terms of actual polls or almost 30% in betting markets, you saw things like green technology rally 25%. And that's on top of already rallying 50 to 75%. Um, so there's still, you know, there's still people chasing uh, to a certain extent. Uh, I think that's going to close here in in the near term, and uh, really markets probably won't be doing too much uh, regarding the election. I think the fiscal policy story is going to get more put on the back burner because I don't think anything's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think that's going to be something more for November and December. Um, and the big story there will be whether or not um, you know, municipalities and so on are going to be willing to lever up and feel comfortable um, uh, based on what happens with the election. So if you get that um, kind of undecided um, condition, uh, that, that'll that be really bad for states and municipalities. Uh, they're not going to feel comfortable potentially levering up thinking that there could be a Trump victory hidden in there somewhere. Um, so that gets back to what Jim's saying. The more um, uh, it's going to, it's got to be some kind of surprise to really get markets going because they're hedged for it and prepared and going the Biden way as we speak. You know, um, just to um, underscore something for the wonks that you said, and you pointed out to me this morning too, the VIX, in, um, the VIX, the move index, which is the VIX of the bond market, jumped from 37 to uh, 10 days ago to 57. That's normally a gigantic move for two weeks, especially when 
Interest rates have only moved up 10 or 12 basis points. That is an astoundingly large move. But the VIX, the, I said it again, the move index looks at options pricing one month out. One month out now encompasses the election. So if we're going to have those types of jumps in protection, option volatility showing uh, um, option protection, it shows you that everybody's braced for something and it really is going to have to be an outlier to really get the markets to react to it. Fiscal policy on your other side. Um, <clears throat> I agree with you that you know everybody in the media is like breathlessly reporting, well, there's not going to be a fiscal deal to the election. Well, does it matter? It's 21 days away at this point. That's not a big deal. But I think more to the point, the markets are expecting something significant soon after the election. Trump has already tweeted out over the weekend, he wants a deal bigger than Pelosi wants. So he's with her. It's just he's got to drag the, Dem uh, the Republican Party along with him in order to vote for something like this in, in, in place. So I think that the markets are expecting a big, healthy dose of stimulus to come after the election. Now, if that falls apart and we get nothing, that could be another big event to look at. But right now, that doesn't look likely. What do you, what do you think about fiscal stimulus falling apart, Ben? Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, I think that we'll get some sort of package here at some point. We've already seen somewhat of a deterioration in, um, you know, in the actual propensity of consumers to spend. You know, search activity is one, one space. I don't care if it's beauty or fitness uh, or whatever. We're starting, starting to see some stresses, like we talked about last time with payday loans. Um, so I think that the impetus is going to be there. Inflation, too, which is just reported um, today. Um, and that had you know, a CPI coming in at around 20 basis points, kind of kind of gliding back to its long run average and boosted so heavily on the core side by used car prices. That's not a fear yet either, too. So I think the, the, the opportunity is going to be there for fiscal stimulus. We just got to get past the election. Um, and I think it'll be easier with the Biden victory. But um, as you said, Trump wants it, too. So hopefully, um, you know, that's something we see in November uh, or early, you know, some point in December. Right. Kristen, how about our second topic? Yes, let's move on to COVID-19. So it, as we've all seen recently, the numbers cases are rising pretty rapidly. Um, are we seeing a second wave coming? Jim, we'll start ben, with you. Or Ben, Ben, we can start I with you if you'd like start. to take this one. Yeah, I think that, you know, the so the second wave, you know, we started to notice uh, really towards the, I'd say um, in August, we track on a, a search activity basis, the amount of um, interest in things like anosmia, loss of taste and smell or sore throats, shortness of breath. And that started to rebound specifically within the central plain, plains and upper Midwest that ultimately led to the huge outbreaks that we've seen with, you know, uh, case counts growth over 100, you know, per 100,000 um, on a seven day rolling average. And now we're getting um, on the global, on the global, on the US level, we're seeing more than 50,000 cases per day for the first time, I think since uh, June or July. Um, so I think there's definitely this second wave going. Now it's, it's, it's focused in specific areas in the Central Plains and the upper Midwest. The big question is gonna be how does that translate or how does it move potentially to the coasts and really kind of the more um, heavier economic engines like California, New York, or Florida. And right now what we're seeing is that search activity is also rebounding there, which could be um, really kind of representative of concern um, as well as potentially some cases starting to migrate uh, to those locations. If we get the same amount of jump in that search activity as we did initially in the Midwest and Central Plains, and then I think for sure there's going to be uh, you know, some kind of market impact. Uh, investors will have to start to realize those going out stocks um, and even maybe industrials to a certain extent are going to see a setback and going to continue to lag the favored industries like technology and so on uh, that did so well coming out of you know, uh, late March. Right. Um, if you look at what's happening in Europe, they're averaging now over the previous seven days, 66,000 cases a day. Their peak in April was 33,000 cases a day. Now, a lot of people, when you bring up those numbers, will push back and say, yeah, but the hospitalization rates are down, the IC units are down, we have better therapeutics, we have a better understanding of the disease. All true. 
<clears throat> and governments aren't going to roll back as much. But what is also clear in Europe, and is clear here in the US to some extent, is that when the case counts spike, after you've spent six months of telling everybody, if you get COVID, you're going to die. When the case counts spike, they change their behavior and economic activity slows. You're seeing that in the state of Wisconsin. State of Wisconsin is probably the worst state in the country right now. It was averaging 600 cases a day in August. It's averaging 2,600 cases a day now. The amount of people going to restaurants and, and out in mobility numbers out of Wisconsin are down substantially. And this is without rollback. So if there's going to be a second wave, it is definitely going to retard economic activity, even if your governor or my governor says, look, we've got therapeutics, we've got this, we've got uh, that. It's no, it's not as big a deal as it was back in March, which is true. You can't tell people you're going to die from it for six months and then say, okay, now it's okay. You can go out and continue your life as if nothing has changed. Um, <clears throat> college students will, but they all think they're bulletproof anyway. Right. But everybody else who's got a comorbidity or older, they will adjust their behavior accordingly. So yeah, second wave will definitely be a drag on the economy. Uh, ben, what's the data say about a vaccine? Um, where are we on that? Yeah, good question. I mean, that's. I think it's something, um, uh, um, you know, I think the, let's talk about first really the sentiment regarding the vaccine from the markets or investors perspective, and then also politicians. Um, you know, the politicians, if you look at all of their COVID or non-COVID related press conferences and briefings are talking a lot about vaccines, more than they ever have. Kind of like we saw when we uh, had masks become the dominant feature in May uh, or in April. Now it's all about vaccines. And I think that markets too are grabbing on to that concept that, um, you know, we saw J&J's kind of uh, issue uh, today, um, uh, but we've seen, obviously there's some promising, you've talked about the five different um, um, vaccines that are in phase three. Um, and, um, you know, I think that, that that race is critical to these politicians that are trying to get the public to be comfortable with this kind of living with this virus. Um, and that's what they're ramming down everybody's throats. And I think the markets are preparing for some kind of breakthrough, you know, in Q1, if not late Q1 um, of next year in order to feel comfortable and then ultimately hopefully give rise finally uh, to these going out stocks that are still lagging so extremely, um, uh, you know, the rest of the staying in technology crowd and so on. So in terms of when one comes out, you know, I'm not in the biotech or pharma industry, I don't know. Uh, maybe Jim knows some more information on that, but from the investor perspective, I think they're 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 following what politicians are are heavily preaching right now that this vaccine is going to come at some point, um, and um, and kind of save the day Q1 or late Q1 20, 2021. Right. I, the only thing I'd say about a vaccine is is twofold. Um, Operation Warp Speed. It's again worthy of reminding people of what that is and why that's significant. Um, there's the five uh, vaccines that are in phase three clinical trials. When your vaccine makes it to phase three, the government then spends a billion dollars plus to order up hundreds of millions of doses of it immediately. So they're already making the doses for all five of those. Now, if your vaccine doesn't make it through phase three, there's a problem with it, they'll throw it out. And that's billions of dollars wasted. Or if somebody comes to market first and it's effective and everybody gets that vaccine and the virus goes away, they'll throw the rest out. So fiscal conservatives could shake their head and go, God, what a boondoggle Operation Warp Speed is. And they're probably right. And no one cares because this is what everybody wants. They want what the, mid, the day after it's been approved, it will be ready for people to take it. The other issue is, Anthony Fauci has said that the vaccine can be 70% effective. There's going to be, because I've seen this a lot in the polls too, there's going to be a, um, a selling point on that. 70% effective will bring the r naught of it down less than one. If everybody gets it and 70% of it, you've hit herd immunity is what you've essentially done. If, if, if everybody takes the vaccine and 70% of the people can't get sick from it, you've eventually hit herd immunity. But it sounds like to a lot of people that are older with comorbidities, you mean I've got only a three in 10 chance of dying? No, thank you. I'll still sit at home 
and wait until this thing goes away. So it, there might be that lingering kind of fear about the vaccine. And then the other one is safety, that they're, they, they're rushing so hard with this vaccine. There's a fair number of people that aren't anti-vaxxers that are going to go, great, Ben, you go first. I'll see how it goes for you. You know, and then I'll, I'll figure out, you know, or as, as one guy once said to me, he says, if they come out with a vaccine, I want to see Fauci take it first. I want to see Trump take it second. I want to test it on my dog. And then if all of them pass, then I'll consider taking it and stuff. And so that's kind of, you know, there's going to be a fair number of people with that. My point is, even if we get it in the first quarter, it doesn't mean that February 1st, they prove it February 8th, everything opens up. It still may take three, four months. and that gets us to our our final topic, the economy. So Kirsten, what is our final topic? Go ahead and tell them. Sure, so the economy. Let's talk about the progress on reopening. Where are we at from a time perspective? Let me take that because I was just about to say, we get that vaccine and it takes three or four months. Here's the biggest issue I see with the economy reopening, uh, or two issues. First of all, we have done so much damage to the economy right now that even if, by the end of the time we're recording this, that a big red headline comes across on our screen and says, vaccine approved, you know, doses start tomorrow. It's a lot of businesses that are still gonna be going over the side anyway. And there's gonna be a lot of businesses that if you told them the vaccine will be approved in the first quarter and by April or May, things can start to return to normal, they'll turn to you and go, I can't make it that long. I'm losing too much money. I won't be in business by April or May of next year. <clears throat> as as well too. So that's the first issue with it. I'll save my second issue comment. Ben, I know you've said you've looked at some of the data on bankruptcies and stuff. What's that saying about how companies are surviving right now? Yeah, I think that there was a, a bigger uptick than most were expecting. So we had, you know, 747 chapter 11 commercial bankruptcy filings last month. And that's that's a much above kind of estimates that we had and most had somewhere in, you know, in the mid 600s. And I think what's happening is that we're getting this kind of uh, continued flow of smaller businesses that are folding. So on the uh, for those that have more than 50 billion, sorry, 50 million in liabilities, um, we've seen a peak in, in bankruptcy activity somewhere around August 20th or so in terms of filings. Um, but on the smaller side, you know, for smaller companies, that seems to be rolling in quite heavily. Now, I think markets, and if you look at high yield OAS or even the triple C's versus double B's or triple B's and that spread compression um, that we've seen that's been pretty fa favorable and risk on has been following more of these bigger companies. How many of these big behemoths are going belly up? And there hasn't been uh, necessarily um, a lot of those over the past month. There were in, in prior months. But what I'm watching most here is, for example, the Bloomberg uh, bankruptcy, corporate bankruptcy index, which measures the severity of those 50 uh, million plus um, in liability companies and how many of them are going bankrupt and so on. And if that peaked in August and we're not too far from off from that peak, I do not want to see that broken out. I don't want to see a break above that, above that level. If we get that, that's going to mean that the high yield market, um, you know, leverage loans, and numerous other spaces uh, kind of in the riskier end of credit are in the wrong place um, and that there is greater bankruptcy and default risk out there and insolvency risk than that's priced in. I mean, really solvency risk is extremely low uh, when measured right now from a financial market perspective. So um, I think that's a lurking risk that's getting more heightened than people realize and has to be watched into year end very closely. Final thought I would give you here on um, the economy is we went into a deep hole with the with the shutdown. We have V bottomed out of that hole, but around late July, we kind of stalled on the recovery. We're not going backwards, but digging out of that hole or climbing out of that hole, to use my metaphor correctly, has really slowed down quite a bit. And if it's going to take, you know, to the end of 21 to kind of get back to the pre-pandemic levels, there's going to be a lot more pain. And I think that that's why there's been this urgency for fiscal stimulus to the point now where the Hill.com reported last week that Mnuchin and Pelosi have a third person on the line with them when they're talking about a fiscal deal. And that's Jay Powell. And uh, that the Federal Reserve chairman is seeing a giant need for it too. And I think it's been motivated by this idea that 
we're not going backwards on the recovery, but we need to recover faster because a lot of businesses can't make it. Ben, any other thoughts about the economy? Yeah, so we take a lot of this, uh, you know, kind of fancy alternative data and try to project what, you know, what's going to happen with retail sales. What are consumers going to do, or what are they doing now? Um, and we're we're getting fearful that September um, and then potentially October are going to be flat to potentially negative um, on retail sales month over month, which I think would be a huge surprise. Right now, um, economists are expecting somewhere around 0.8 percent month over month for September. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see a, a kind of a number that undershoots that by quite a bit. I think that will rattle um, both um, Main Street, Wall Street, you know, uh, the White House and uh, start to send some jitters and, and maybe that will continue the, uh, the, for people to have, or not people from Mnuchin, Pelosi and Powell to continue these discussions. Um, I think it will help push along fiscal stimulus, but I think it also might start to rev up some of the, the Federal Reserve, especially considering inflation has decelerated everywhere but used car prices for the most part. I mean, the appliances, apparel, where we're seeing weakness in search activity and where we think there'll be weakness in retail sales, those prices um, uh, fell um, you know, last month. So I think that that is, um, um, it's going to be interesting to see this number, this retail sales number coming up. And then of course for October uh, going forward, because as Jim said, things have plateaued since July. If we do get some weakness, not just plateauing any longer, heading towards um, year end and, and the election, um, that's going to be concerning. Right. Jen, how about some final thoughts today as we wrap it up? Yeah. Um... I, I'll come back to our first topic one more time. Everybody's obsessed about the election. And I just think that unless you're blown away on election night and go, wow, I didn't expect that, um, I don't think you're going to see a big move out of markets. Ben? Yeah, I, I agree. I think the hedging is there. Um, you know, the only thing would have to be some kind of calamity. Uh, you know, I think in the bond market, the risk is, is there a big enough calamity to cause, you know, yields to fall? That's where individuals are not necessarily as hedged. That'd be kind of, the, you know, more or less the pain trade if there's just a huge debacle of some sort. And we have, there's just incredible uncertainty. We have no idea who's gonna win and something happens. Um, that would be somewhat of the pain trade. So uh, I don't think the election is gonna be the, that big, you know, the, that big of an event as people think it's going to be because it's already been discussed and hedged so much. Fiscal stimulus will be, but that's gonna be, we're weeks away um, from that really uh, becoming you know, a big topic again. Yeah, I think that I, just a final thought and I'll turn over to you, Kristen. Uh, I think the biggest event might be um, if what we talked about in the last section is that if if the uh, recovery really starts to stumble a lot more, that there will be a lot of people running around going, what's going on here? We got to get this thing moving a lot faster. And that seems to be the, you know, the more concerning story for me. Thank you both for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And thank you for audience to, for joining us as well. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm that produces innovative research across a broad range of global fixed income, equity, currency, and commodity markets. Bianca Research and Arbor Data Science are our two most dominant research offerings. For further information on Arbor Research, Bianco Research, and Arbor Data Science, please contact Gus Handler or Gus Handler, Gus.handler at arborresearch.com.